When people talk about rhythm, there can be a lot of fancy terminology attached to the definition, but in essence, it's the component of music that tells us when to play, when we should be silent, and how long each instance of playing or silence should be. Reading and understanding the rhythmic component of a piece of music requires the ability to recognize the value of every note you see through its anatomy, as well as having the knowledge of how to piece these notes together based on the math behind the music. My name is Elliot Duran, let's go ahead and jump into the next chapter of the basics, how to read rhythms. Let's begin by talking about the math behind the music. I use this phrase to describe one of the most important attributes of reading and writing rhythms, and it refers to the fact that the total value held by the notes and rests within a measure must add up to the value the measure is allowed by its time signature. We'll refer to this relationship from here on out as a rhythmic equation. Let's see how it works in action using some examples. The time signature of this bar tells us that we should expect its contents to add up exactly to the value held by four beats of chord notes. The left side of our rhythmic equation will therefore be four. Let's check out the right side of the equation by adding up the notes and rests. There are four chord notes in this measure, which are each one count long, and there are no rests. The total value of the contents in the measure is therefore four. The equation is balanced, meaning the expectation set by the time signature has been successfully met. The time signature here is still 4-4, but the contents of the measure have changed slightly. The first three notes are still chord notes, but the last note has changed from a chord note into a half note. Our understanding of the rhythmic hierarchy of note values lets us know that a half note holds the same amount of space that two chord notes do. By changing this note, we've caused this measure to have the equivalent of five chord notes worth of music in it. So although the left side of the equation remains the same as the previous example, the right side has gone from 4 to 5 beats. The equation is unbalanced, meaning this measure is incorrectly written and is not performable. Let's take a look at one last example. There are a couple of new ideas in this final example measure. We're no longer occupying the entire measure with notes, there are now rests in the mix. Although rests are indications of silence, they still hold specific amounts of space depending on the value of the rest. Chord note rests, for example, occupy the same amount of space that a chord note does, or one count each. We've also introduced some eighth notes into the picture. We know from our hierarchy that each of these eighth notes holds half of the value a chord note does, or half a count. Adding up a chord note and two eighth notes adds up to two counts, and adding up the rests gives us two more counts. When we look at the right and left side, we find that the rhythmic equation is balanced and the measure works as it should. Although I've shown you some examples of measures that work and ones that don't, this exercise was mostly for the purpose of helping you understand that music is structured in a mathematical way. In practice, a composer will rarely make a mistake regarding the contents in the measure, and the fact that you can trust them in this way makes it so that we can rely on the same counting system no matter what piece of music you're looking at. With that out of the way, let's get into our method for counting rhythms. I want to introduce this rhythmic counting system by describing it alongside an analogy. Let's start with a combination of chord notes within a measure of 4-4. Envision this measure as a length of track, where every beat is represented by a light post controlled by a switch. Whether the switch is on or off depends on whether there's a chord note on that beat, in which case it's on, or if there is a chord note rest on that beat, in which case the switch would be off. As a musician reads through a rhythm, it's like they're traveling down the track at a constant speed dictated by the tempo. As they cross the light posts, they'll play a note if the light is on, or stay silent if the light is off. The key point of this analogy is that whether the light is on or off, it still exists at a specific point on the track for the musician to check. In the same fashion, whether a beat is occupied by a note or a rest, it's still important to acknowledge it and not skip over it just because there is or isn't a note there. Additionally, whether the light is on or off does not affect the even steady speed the musician travels at. Time, for the most part, is very linear in music, and unless indicated otherwise, it will always continue through both notes and rests at an even and steady pace. A great way for you to internalize this underlying skeleton is by learning to vocalize it. Let's first make sure we're working at the right speed by pulling out a metronome and setting it to 120 beats per minute. The time signature of our example bar is 4-4. In relation to a whole note, a chord note is a single count long. So the first step of our counting system will involve identifying each of these counts by assigning numbers to them in order. Next, you'll count them out loud, counting a new number every time you hear a click from your metronome. Once you reach the number 4, return to count 1 for the next click and repeat. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. These vocals are your underlying skeleton. 
Your next task is to look at each beat of the example bar and check whether each light is on or off, metaphorically speaking of course. In this case, counts 1 and 4 are holding notes, so those switches are on, and counts 2 and 3 hold rests, so those switches are off. Choose between clapping your hands together or tapping on your leg while sitting down. As you vocalize the skeleton of the measure, clap or tap every time there's a note on the beat and stay silent when there's a rest on the beat. Together, the click of the metronome, your vocalizations, and your playing should match up like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. If you can clap your way through this measure, you've successfully played your first rhythm. Let's move on and try to string multiple measures together. Look at the following four measure phrase. Let's review the steps. You'll first identify which counts hold notes and which hold rests. You'll vocalize the underlying rhythm to a metronome. And lastly, you'll play along to the counts with notes and stay silent on the counts with rests. Work through each bar individually first, then try to string them together in sequence, playing them back to back. I'll give you a chance to pause the video to go through that process on your own first, and then we'll go through it together. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. If you're able to count and play your way through these four bars, then you've developed a good understanding for the way chord note values work within the context of our rhythm counting system. Of course, practice makes perfect, and if you're looking to get better at reading and performing new rhythms quicker and with more accuracy, we have a lesson pack that's perfect for you. With more than 40 pages of information, diagrams, and sheet music, as well as a litany of helpful play-along tracks at multiple tempos, this pack is guaranteed to help you get better at the act of sight reading, as well as heighten your rhythmic accuracy. Head on over to our website, bassdrumgroup.com, to grab the pack that supplements this video. We're now going to move on to the next lower subdivision in the rhythmic hierarchy, the eighth note. We already know that an eighth note holds half of the value that a chord note does. If we put two eighth notes together, that space is equivalent to the one held by one chord note. So mathematically, chord notes and eighth notes line up like this. The ands in between the four main counts are the ways that we vocalize upbeats. Upbeats are what lie in between downbeats, which are the main strong beats in a measure, or counts one, two, three, and four in this case. To vocalize this successfully, we would maintain the chord notes we've been working with so far and add in the ands exactly in the space in between the chord notes. It's vital that you're splitting up the spaces evenly, like so. 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and. Moving forward, these are 8th note rests. Just like chord note rests, 8th note rests hold the same exact value of time their note counterpart does. Let's look at an example bar to see how this puzzle piece fits into our counting system. The first beat is occupied by a chord note, and the next one is occupied by two eighth notes. Beats 3 and 4 each hold two eighth note containers, with the first holding a rest and the second holding a note. The system works exactly as it did when we were only working with chord notes, except that now we're working within a finer subdivision of rhythms. Within the context of our track analogy, it's like putting a light post in between each of the ones representing our chord notes. Count all the eighth notes in the measure, with the downbeats lined up perfectly to the metronome, then proceed to clap or tap on only the notes that aren't rests, like so. 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 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 Look at the next set of four measures and try to work through them in the same way you work through the chord note measures. Remember your process. I'll give you a second to pause and work through the phrase on your own, then I'll play through it so you can listen to the correct interpretation and see how you did. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Let's go ahead and move on to our next rhythmic subdivision, the sixteenth note. As we know, just like two eighth notes fit into the space of one chord note, two sixteenth notes fit into the space of one eighth note. This is therefore like placing even more light posts between the ones we laid down to represent the downbeats and upbeats. Like eighth notes, this rhythm also has its respective vocalizations. In this case, the note between the downbeat and the and count is vocalized as E, and the one between the and count and the next downbeat is called the uh. 
Because this is a denser rhythm, we're going to be working at a slower tempo so you can still build a great understanding without being overwhelmed by more notes. At 90 beats per minute, a full bar of 16th notes will be vocalized like so. 1e e and a 2e e and a 3e e and a 4e e and a 1e e and a 2e e and a 3e e and a 4e e and a... Of course, with the 16th note comes a 16th note rest, which again, both hold the same equivalent value, either 1 16th of a whole note, or 1 quarter of a chord note. Look at the next example measure, and then go through the rhythmic counting system we've used thus far. Realize that all that's changing as we look at more and more subdivisions is that our units of measurement, so to speak, are getting finer. It's sort of like looking at feet within a mile, and then at inches within a foot. I'll give you a second to pause and attempt the measure on your own, then we can go through it together. 1e e and a 2e e and a 3e e and a 4e e and a 1e e and a 2e e and a 3e e and a 4e e and a 1e e and a 2e e and a 3e e and a 4e e and a 1e e and a 2e e and a 3e e and a 4e e and a... Up until this point, we've only been working with measures of music that are written in a time signature of 4-4, but as we discussed in the previous video of the basics, music won't always be this neat and tidy. Luckily, if you understand how to count rhythms in 4-4, you'll be happy to know there isn't a significant adjustment to be made when we switch the time signature up. Let's look at a measure of 5-4 for example. We've inserted some of the rhythmic subdivisions we've discussed so far, but the thing I want you to pay attention to is the way the time signature has changed our counting system, or rather, how little it's changed. All that's changed is that we're adding a count, or a metaphorical light post, and we're counting to 5 instead of to 4. The rhythms on count 5 itself are not counted any differently, we're simply tagging them onto the 4 that we've been counting until this point as part of one measure. What about a more obscure time signature, like 6-8 for example? In this instance, we've not only changed the number of beats from 4 to 6, but we've also changed the note value assigned to operate as the beat, an 8th note instead of a chord note. Let's look at what this means by filling up a bar with 6 8th notes. In cases like this, it might be slightly ambiguous as to where the beat lies. On one hand, we can group the 8th notes into pairs, like so. This however, is the equivalent of playing 6 8th notes in a measure of 3 4. Usually, a bar of 6 8 actually involves grouping 6 8th notes into two sets of three notes with the 1st and 4th notes serving as the strong beats. This measure would therefore be counted like this. 1 and a, 2 and a. Of course, you can't be faulted for not knowing this, because without beaming, it's virtually impossible to tell what the composer's intentions are in terms of note groupings and odd timing signatures, especially if you're seeing them for the first time. You've already seen beaming in action, but just to formally define it, it's the horizontal lines connecting 8th note and finer subdivisions together. Beaming also gives us an opportunity to simplify some of the writing we've looked at today. Look at the next two measures, compare them, and see if you can find some sort of relationship between them. Pay close attention to the anatomy of the notes and rests, as well as the beaming between them. You should have found that although the markings we use for each measure are different, the overall counts of music are the same. If a percussionist were to play through both on a snare drum, the performances would be identical, and herein lies what I call the equivalence of rhythms. The math behind the music allows us to switch between the way we write note and rest values if they're equivalent in terms of the space that they hold up. Two 16th note rests can be rewritten into an 8th note rest, one 16th note followed by three 16th note rests can be rewritten as a chord note, and vice versa. The ability that music has of being compounded and divided up in this way is what makes the combination of rhythms virtually infinite. Finer subdivisions of rhythms do exist, and we have yet to cover how tuple-based subdivisions fit into the equation, but we will do our best to cover all of this as it becomes relevant. For now though, you should have a decent understanding of how to count the essential binary rhythms in a few different time signatures. If you're looking for a great way to practice lots of different combinations of everything we've talked about thus far, as well as additional discussions about tempo and time that we did not get to cover in this video, head on over to BassDrumGroup.com to grab our supplementary lesson pack. It's a good resource to pair with this video if you don't have constant access to the internet as a student, and it serves as a great educational tool in a classroom if you're an instructor. You'll also find some sweet gear you can purchase if you're looking to contribute to the growth of this project. As always, all of your love and support is incredibly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to catch you in the next video. Peace.